All right, uh, so today is the last lecture uh, for my module, and I went through the summaries early this morning. Um, so this is the first thing we're going to cover. I didn't say it here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the student presentation that are starting tomorrow. Um, and, you know, the, the semester is going on, so <clears throat> we're having fewer and fewer students in class. But it's really good to see that you are following the lecture. <laughs> um, all these summaries, my first comment is um, it's good quality. It's very good quality, and um, in general, people do focus on what they've learned. And it is a challenge with a write-up where there's a big difference between saying, well, this is what we've talked about. You know, it's, it, it's more of an outline as opposed to um, things that you're taking out of it or action items. And, and I find that sometimes even in just in meeting minutes, you know, we talked about this. Okay, well, it doesn't matter really because the mo what's important is what you've learned. So what's the action item and what you're going to do about it. Um, the main uh, takeaway, as I understand it, is really the different ways that you can make the shapes of the material. That's a recurrent theme that you guys seem to appreciate. Um, I was surprised about uh, the, the, the understanding at this point of the deformation processing. I think it's a relatively challenging topic, but it seems that uh, you all understood the implication, the need for it, and what's happening during deformation. Um, there was one aspect that I didn't emphasize a whole lot is the welding. So welding, we went a little quickly. We talked about lack of fusion, so we'll go back a little bit to that today through an exam two examples I have. Um, so again, this, this worked very well. Uh, the surface engineering, a lot of people talked about it, um, the benefit of adding a coating, galvanizing, and all that. Um, the, the polymers, I understand that I went through it a little quickly. It was one lecture that we said, you know, if you're going to process something, that is a polymer, you go through these molecules, and I think most people understood that, but um, half of them, I think, were um, developing um, more on this. I think it was just part of two lectures, or three lectures, as opposed to being one lecture in particular. Um, failure analysis, um, we're always impressed by how people, how you guys remember um, some of the examples, including uh, I have people that are putting on numbers for typical strength and how it's changing depending on different conditions. That's all great. Um, one part about failure analysis that um, I want to emphasize is it points to how difficult it is to do something from first principle in terms of engineering. And we've talked about that very briefly, but I thought for today we'll emphasize it a little bit more. If you take a mirror view in terms of building major new innovation, um, it doesn't quite work the first time. It is, it's, it's so complex, there's so many parameters that come into play that it's very um, easy not to know about something that's gonna end up to matter. So it's a, it is most typically an iterative process unless you can tie into something that exists that is you know, very similar in terms of application and how you would build it. So you use the history of another application to get it almost right the first time. So that's possible. And um, that's why sometimes if, you, if you're thinking about building something and that's something that comes up, Every time somebody talks about a student presentation, a topic is I try to work with them on things that are already out there that you can learn from before you get too, too deep into your own thinking. Um, so sometimes it is useful to have our own point of view to think, oh, well, you know, there's got to be something wrong with the way it's, it's being done right now. And we have um, an example on Thursday. Uh, Liz is going to talk about these uh, ski um, poles so, so you can 
uh, do the slalom races, and they break all the time. They replace them every year, and it's peace going and flying, and there's got to be a solution, but why isn't it out there? And um, I think you'll see more of that, at least half of the presentation that I've been uh, helping uh, the students with is trying to put it a little bit in context. So that's my suggestion for the presentation starting tomorrow and going through the week is um, take a little bit of a perspective as a, um, a, a rising engineer. Okay, so I think this is really cool. It has these potential benefits. Where does it fit in the big picture? You know, is it used right now? What is being used and why? Because it, it shows that you're conscious that it's not just research. So um, this class, uh, we, when we talk about material selection, when we talk about material processing, you can go and dive into why this is great and um, all kind of the antiquity of, of a certain application, but um, to the extent you can. And, and sometimes if you don't have all the background, um, send us an email, uh, we'll guide you a little bit. Um, the idea is to think about your audience. Nobody here is an expert into, let's say, tractors, uh, John Deere tractors, or um, you know, automotive uh, frames, uh, batteries, um, except maybe you sometimes. So we have a few students that will show things that they've done an internship on, or they've done uh, you know, a final year project. Sometimes it's the beginning of a thesis. And that's all okay. Uh, I think that the biggest uh, challenge or, or what I, I think I, we would like you guys to work on is to package it a little bit so we can all agree on a certain number of principles. And when you do that process, it helps your thinking. You know, when you, when you have to prepare a presentation, say, okay, so what exactly um, is the range of parameters that are important here as to whether this is going to be used, potentially going to be used, or we don't know. So sometimes, uh, we had an example this morning, a new, completely new application for a concrete. Well, we don't know if it's going to be used, right? So we can go and say, well, um, how, how are they going to decide? You know, how long is it going to take to know and what kind of things are going to be done? Uh, it's great to describe the technology. We, we believe in the dive. We, we, we like you guys to go and learn and, and get excited about an application. But putting it in the context, I think, is a good it's a good learning experience. Uh, okay, so um, a couple things then. So that was a little bit. So the mirror view applies to most topics that you guys pick are new things. And what the problem with new things is to put them into context. And the context is a lot of times you'll think it's the greatest thing, and then it turns out it's going to be used for a very special application. It's, it's, a, it's a very typical situation, and we'll go to that with um, a few examples later. Um, the polymers, one thing, again, is it doesn't corrode, um, but it oxidizes, right? So um, that's something I was hoping to see a little bit more, and it's perfectly fine. It means that I spoke, I think, clearly, but very quickly, and it happens to me a lot. So, um, it, one, that's, so that would be a suggestion to think of that um, as well, one of the driver why it's not there all the time. The other driver that I think most of you knew from the beginning is the creep. So under sustained load, the polymer is going to deform. Uh, if you remember, one big advantage is um, it it's relatively inexpensive to manufacture. So you can see that a lot of what's going on with structural material when we're thinking about minimizing the total cost is we rule out very specific cases where it's just not going to work. You know, it's, if you can't fix the oxidation or the uh, UV stability of a certain polymer, well, it's not use outdoor, it's, it's just that simple. Or you have to put carbon black, so you block the UV light, for example, of it, and, and that's done in certain applications. But it's, it's, it's all about putting uh, these constraints. And um, it is something that I cover in the, uh, in the spring. So I think we went through this, yes, good. 
So for the spring, what I try to emphasize is um, the process of actually using materials. So sort of the follow-up, in my mind, um, of what we discussed here for how to make parts. Um, the, the basic way I, I think of it is um, you have to specify. You have to be very clear um, as a designer or an engineer um, what exactly would you like. You know, if you say stainless steel, well, some of them are going to corrode, some of them are going to stress crack, some of them are just very soft. So what stainless steel are you looking for and why? If you're looking for aluminum, I think you all know now that there's a big difference between a casting, a forging, an extrusion. So all these parameters needs to come into play. Um, and then um, from the time it's specified, um, there is still a lot of process to get it built. Um, when you um, evaluate a structure, uh, you have to decide what is going to be the acceptable failure rate. So uh, a lot of time we refer to the factor of safety. And um, there is a lot of parameter that come into this. And um, the, the rule of thumb for a factor of safety that um, I emphasize through a bunch of examples in that module is the more you know about an application and the characteristic of what you're building, the lower you need of a factor of safety. Uh, if, you, if you can tell this is going to be the maximum pulling force on this crane and uh, this is the minimum strength that the chain is going to have and um, otherwise, it's going to tip over, for example, and therefore it's not a material issue. It's, it's an overall mechanical design issue. Well, then you're, you're in good shape because you, you'll calculate everything and you, you'll shim down your factor of safety for minimizing the cost and a lot of time adding functionality. So a lot, like the crane example, <laughs> is if it's too heavy, you get stuck on a construction site. So it just isn't great at all. Um, are you, you damaging a lot of things you're going into? So it's very rare that you can just focus on, on cost and um, the, the issue of the factor of safety comes in a lot um, in the process of selecting materials, selecting the process, and making the specification. Um, so we go through that in details and talk more about how you find it out. And one thing that came into the, uh, the, the summaries for, for this uh, fall uh, semester is um, we talked about reducing strength from welding, for example. That was for cyclic load. So the factor of 10 there is when the load is going up and down and, and it's not steady. So for a typical building or structure that doesn't see a whole lot of cycles of loading, you don't have that much of a reduction factor from welding. And that's why we use it quite a bit. If it's a limited amount of loading cycles, of large loading cycles, then welding is, is used a lot. And you're looking at about a factor of two at most reduction in your allowable strength. Um, so that's just, that's why there is a lot here into dis discussing the factor of safety. And then, um, What's a little different is I spend a little time on material selection um, because I think it's best understood um, if you're going to do it for a very specific project after you understand the entire process. Um, if you uh, want to think about using um, a new uh, polymer, for example, for an application, uh, you can't start by thinking directly of the polymer. You have to consider how am I going to get it, how it's going to be made, and how it's going to be tested, and how am I going to know it's going to be good for 50 years. <laughs> and after you've, you've collected some information about these parameters, you're more able to make a final decision. And then um, really, um, this spring, we spend more time on failure analysis. And the example are different. So a lot of, uh, of things that uh, we've covered, um, 
like the World Trade Center, that's something I may just go back to, but I have cranes and um, the blowout preventer, so the BP spill that I worked on for the valve manufacturer uh, is just, it happens, and, and, and we learn from it, um, and that's mostly what I want to emphasize in the class. Okay, uh, so we've talked about your student presentation, putting it into a context, so we'll dive back a little bit. Um, what happened yesterday on corrosion is there's a lot of items that I didn't go through um, in sufficient uh, depth, I felt, so we're gonna spend just a few minutes there. Um, I've seen it in the summary that um, there are things that I just uh, couldn't get to. So, um, I think that was understood, the fact that you always have an anode and a cathode, even if it, on a bare surface, and um, this is probably something you can remember. Um, so you have a cut pipe of portable water copper and on the inside, um, there was a deposit here, and by taking the deposit off, you see it's almost as if it's drilled. So on the cross section here, so we're looking from the inside, going to the outside, it's, it's a little bit like a drill hole and it's smaller in the end, and what you see is that there's a deposit build up on the outside. So that relates to what you see on the copper pipe here. So what can we conclude here is that portable water line corroded locally. So why did it look like it's drilled? It's the pitting. And the pitting in this case is highly favored because we have this copper and the, the copper has this protective film, but when you uh, lose the stability of that film, in this case, it was by having a lot of use of this water, so there's some deposit being carried from the large water heater into the system, um, you get this, this different condition. So it's a little bit like a crevice condition where you, you have a different environment in that one area and that's where the, 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 uh, the pitting starts. Um, so <laughs> as far as the example, the uh, interesting thing is why did the, uh, the leak stop is the buildup of the deposit just from the, ev the evaporation on the outlet here on the OD, the outside diameter of the pipe uh, was, was strong enough to stop leakage. So this pipe was still being used. Um, <clears throat> even though it had, in this section, um, maybe a, a, a about five uh, true wall uh, pits. So on this situation, we're not worried about uh, having, um, you know, deposit on the surface, so the appearance doesn't matter. But the long-term life of this is, is definitely not guaranteed. You'll start to, uh, pit at joints or at other location or eventually these pits are going to grow and the deposits not going to protect them anymore. So um, they had to do replacements um, after a while because it was just continuing to grow and the deposit will eventually fall off. It's a little bit like putting a hard coating on that copper surface. It works for a while and then you get to a certain size that it's going to break and, and, and have small leaks. So one uh, Advantage here is it is water, um, uh, so the consequences in terms of safety risk are typically not high. There are exceptions if, uh, if this is a uh, server room, so a lot of water leak if they are related to um, the use of computer or, or servers is, is a problem. Uh, nobody likes water leaks, but um, a lot of times they'll happen just because of a special condition. Here it really was a, a lot of, of flow through those pipes at relatively high rate and some deposits getting on the surface. Um, here's another example. Um, I refer to generally in, um, a number of factors that would happen in pipes. Um, 
These are unfortunately not as uncommon as we'd like. So we have tubercle uh, building up in this steel pipe. And we do have a lot of steel pipe, um, let's say for fire prevention and um, also HVAC, so heating and cooling. Um, what happens with those system, and this is something we discussed a few lectures ago, is if you don't have oxygen, so if it's a closed loop system, you don't have the ability to keep corroding and eventually it stops. Um, so one problem is uh, with the HV system that have an, uh, a little bit of an open loop, so there's a cooling tower and there's a supply of oxygen coming back into the system, that's a situation where you're at risk to have this buildup on the inside. So it leads to local corrosion, a little bit the same way that we've seen on the copper. It doesn't look exactly as sharp, so it, um, it doesn't give, like I guess, reminding uh, or, um, you know, exceptional examples. But, you know, under the tubercle, it's not uncommon to have half the, the wall thickness lost. Um, so the main sit resolution for something like this is adding inhibitors to the fluid being circulated. So you stop the corrosion that way by uh, controlling the environment. So the oxygen at that point doesn't matter. The example to the right, uh, you can see here it's becoming paper thin. Uh, so what happens is you have the flow in that pipe from the top coming down and there is this point here where there's turbulence. Um, and at a certain velocity, we've talked about an erosion taking place, so you lose the stability of the protective film. The copper has a copper oxide on the surface there and you just um, destroy it too often and therefore you have a section loss in that area. So these are, uh, I guess, more visuals for um, essentially leaks. Now for appearance, we've talked about stainless steel and I want to bring a few uh, additional examples. One common problem with stainless steel is contamination with uh, another steel. So let's say you're trying to assemble something out of stainless steel and you use a hammer or a wrench that's made out of regular steel, you can contaminate that surface or just hooks to handle it. And it looks like this. This is a big pressure vessel on the surface. You see the rust and there's a test where you clean that surface and then you put a little bit of a, um, a etchant solution, a reactive solution, and when it turns pink like here, you know it's because you have ion contamination we call so essentially a little bit of smearing of regular steel over the stainless steel and therefore you know that that's not because the original material was not correct, it's because of what happened after the fact. Um, I brought these plates yesterday and I couldn't get um, into the details of why it was corroded and I mentioned about it. Um, so these are just markers. We were doing a bunch of other tests at the same time, um, but they help us locate. So let's see on top here, you see the, the, the site where there's more staining. And uh, by looking more closely under the microscope, what you see at those sites is embedded particles. So when they did the, the sandblasting equivalent on the surface at the shop before everything was installed, they, the, the, the pressure applied to feed the particle to make the surface very rough was sufficient that the particles actually embedded in the surface. So you, if you start with um, almost corrosion pit, it makes sense that you're going to corrode very easily in surface. And um, that's really what happened here. So just things to avoid. Um, this example is, um, uh, for architectural purposes, uh, the Miami International Airport had a lot of these um, embossed, embossed brush stainless. So um, I don't have a far view image of this one, but it's just a big, these big columns. It looks great, very neat. Um, and they had this um, process of um, working on the pavement. They did essentially an acid etch to prepare the surface, put a 
put a coating and they didn't have enough ventilation so the entire room kind of got pretty acidic, just the moisture in this case. So it started to pit the stainless, this is how it looks. Um, after a, 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 a replacement, a partial replacement. So what happened in this case is you see on the upper right still the holes. So very similar to what we've seen in the copper pits. Go very, very deep at one specific site. There wasn't anything really with the surface uh, that was a problem to begin with. Of course, having a brush condition is not as good as having a polish condition to prevent the pitting. But the main factor was this um, environment that was acidic enough, enough chloride to get the, the pits to start. And the process, um, they've been through before we got involved was to um, sand the entire surfaces um, to get them looking good again and cleaning them. Um, but it didn't work. So what the, the exact site between uh, this position and this position is here you can see the last, the, the brush finished. So it's, it's more of a smooth surface. So it's after, it's corroded, they try to clean it up, but they still have the hole. So after cleaning this, you can see a little bit this, there's a few sites that are the same, or maybe they're not the same, I can't tell actually. Um, the, the idea here is um, the polishing didn't get rid of the same, these little holes. So um, the only way not having to replace all these panels uh, was to do like we discussed yesterday, to just put a little coating to prevent, protect against the chlorides. Um, and the chlorides, um, this is just a, a slide I, I, I wish I had when I started uh, talking about stainless steel, it took me a little while before putting my hand on it. It doesn't have all the grades, so this one starts with 316. Um, the 304 stainless is lower here, but it gives you a combination of temperature and chlorine level where uh, you start having um, a problem of, of pitting. So, Essentially, the chemistry of the stainless steel will help you with the stability of that surface. Um, so you have to, if, if, if that's your concern, the appearance, you have to be very, very careful. And even on a, um, a very simple structure by the ocean, um, there are a lot of stainless steel that just won't resist those chloride concentrations, especially if it's a hot day and you had cycles of mist, so deposit of salt. You can get greater concentration of salt water on structures that are actually not in the water, that they're receiving mist and, and they have a buildup of condensation evaporation on the, on the surface. Um, so <laughs> that hopefully clears out that pitting is serious, it does happen, and it's related to the stability of, of the film. Um, we had the case for the steel where you, if in a process plant or in circulating water, you can work with the environment, but it's not typically the case if you're thinking about a general application, in general for the application. You have the environment and then you have to make cost decisions. So here, um, it's just, the way things are, as you go to higher uh, chlorine um, uh, capacity, chlorine content capacity of pitting, you have more alloying element and the alloy is more expensive. It's, it's not a linear function, but it's mostly uh, how it works. So um, it's a little bit of a departure from forming that we've talked about earlier, but again, I, the reason I bring it into this class is it's an important, another important factor on, on how you go about making. Uh, you, it, it doesn't matter that you can have this aluminum heat treatment if in reality it's going to pit a lot easier. Uh, so uh, it's a very, that's actually a very specific example. So on aluminum structures for aircrafts, we will use an overage alloy that instead of having all these very tiny precipitates, have bigger precipitates that are not 
uh, as much of a threat for initiating pitting. Um, and it's stainless, right? So it doesn't mean that it's not going to corrode. In fact, uh, if you are uh, buried in the ground, uh, there'll be condition where the stainless is going to corrode exactly at the same rate as regular steel. And uh, one reason is you lose that stability film on the surface um, in, in a lot of um, soy environments. So uh, it's, in general, it's not worth the money. Uh, there were a few cases where it was uh, marginally faster corrosion with the stainless in the ground, but it's not common. Um, this is an example I brought, I discussed in class very briefly, so we're switching gear here, going to um, just two examples with the, uh, the uh, 15 more minutes we have today. Um, the first one is polymer nanocomposite, and one idea there is uh, when something new comes up, um, a new way of making things, a lot of time um, it's oversold. So <laughs> uh, people say, well, no, no this is stronger, tougher, more resistant to the environment, and the list goes on and on and on. And then after a while, you get to uh, test the material in different applications, and, and you find um, that it's not true. So th that was a case of nanoclay particle. Um, and I'll try to explain this graph because we've talked about creep a few times. So um, what we're talking here is the uh, deformation rate as a function of the amount of deformation. So uh, it's a test under a constant cyclic load. You take the sample and you say, I'm going to go from 4 megapascal to 40 megapascal repeatedly. So it's, it's loaded cyclically. One reason to do this, it's, it's faster than if I keep it at 40 megapascal all along. So I, I get to accelerate the process of creep deformation by cycling the load. So let's say we all agree to do that. Uh, these tests will last a couple of weeks. And we're interested to know what really those uh, nanoclay particles do into nylon or a polymer. So let's, uh, let's start. If we um, look at the beginning at our evolution of strain rate with the particles, it starts uh, much lower. So here we have less deformation, and the curves just speak to different uh, regime. Uh, so you have your viscoelasticity, uh, kind of, and then here you become into a real uh, viscous flow. So from 1% strain going forward, those two samples just had a very steady deformation rate of 10 to the minus 7. Um, and you have to wait quite a bit for this condition to set. So the way these deformation processes work is you had viscous flow from the beginning, but let's say the viscous flow was always at 10 to the minus 7. It wasn't showing up because you had other viscoelasticity processes going on at the same time. So as you exhaust sites for regular viscoelasticity, more of a viscoplastic behavior. Eventually, it is this viscous flow, so a long-term behavior. So we talked about the red. That's the reinforced composite. Now let's talk about um, what happens if you take the same material um, uh, and load it at the same, um, same stress. Uh, you start to see the, um, the, the rate is a lot faster at the beginning, and then eventually when you get into your third stage, uh, well, actually, we didn't get to the, fir the third stage, so at the same stress here, um, or strain, actually, you um, start to lose that uh, benefit. So the, 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 your rate of deformation in the unreinforced condition is uh, becoming the same. Um, the higher load case, we don't have to, to worry about it. So that we're just talking about two things loaded at the same force, 
and the unreinforced case ending up at the same deformation rate because it is the viscous flow. So the conclusion here is after doing a series of development and improvement and making all these claims is if you're thinking about something that's going to have to bear some load for, say, a week or so, um, you, don't, you don't have the, the effect of reinforcement because it's a, it's a movement as a, at a larger scale than the particle that is involved at that point. Um, so that was uh, sort of the lesson learned and the other consequences here, it's not because I wanted to stop the test, it actually broke. So what the particles did was to be an initiation site for um, um, void creation and eventually a separation of the surface. So you initiate a crack more quickly because to some extent you have uh, stress concentration area into the material when you had that viscous flow. Um, some of these material didn't actually fail. It just eventually you have to stop the test when it, it's been so long. So. Um, they were still um, doing these composites for a very specialized application. So it started to be used for um, uh, fire protection, fire, fire pr uh, retardation. So you get a better rating for flame uh, resistance if you had those particles. Also a better uh, re resistance to uh, moisture penetration and oxygen uh, transfer. One issue with them is, you, so you work with a natural material, in that case was clay, to make the nano clay, and there were byproducts. And those byproducts, you see this large particle here, that's not a nano particle, this is one micrometer, so it's 50 micrometers, and it was very hard for the process to eliminate those. So they were determining uh, the, the general area where the crack would start. The crack would start in this case, and we discussed this a little bit, these initiation sites, there'll be one that starts here, 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 and here. So we know that it didn't take that long for that crack to start because you had multiple initiation sites around the particle. And the significance of the reinforcement is in creating those voids in the polymer. So the particle, the polymer, and you see it, it's all full of voids. So it's, it's how the, uh, the cracks start early, it's, it's in that when we talk about stress riser, it's not so much at the nano scale, but in this case it was really at the regular microscope scale. And when I was saying um, in that example, you were changing the microstructure, that is a sphere light here. So you see the nuclei and you see the crack going around it. Um, whereas on the nano composite, um, you don't have that structure and therefore it's not revealed from the fracture surface. It's more of a really granular and microvoid. So this is more of a ladder structure. The same thing you'll get uh, when you uh, draw um, the, the, the polymer to make uh, cords, for example. Um, so very different behavior. Um, you can learn a lot um, essentially by looking after the fact. It takes time though. So these were things that were not being used yet. Nobody said, okay, well, I'm going to use this uh, for, um, you know, a fluid storage tank in a car where temperature is warm and all that. And I, I can count on being 40% better for this application because in the end, the analysis showed that that was not the case. You'll be potentially failing in a more brittle way and sooner. Okay, so <laughs> um, decided to end the class with uh, what I've been doing this past 18 months um, uh, because I, I, it's the decision that I made this morning when I was looking through the summaries and I've been talking about the difficulty of doing things uh, from first principle and doing something new. So this is something that we're doing with our startup. It's a, it's a new piece of hardware. Um, to attach to the pipeline to test for the, um, the strength without taking a sample out so it's non-destructive. It's a little bit like a hardness test, like a Rockwell and all that. Um, it's the view of what the unit will look like. Um, this is the actual unit. Um, I think I have a little video. 
So it has a number of components. So it's attached here. There's a dust protection. That's why we have a big enclosure. And then the, uh, what we call the core is the work piece for, for our technology. Um, what it does is the video doesn't show there. Great. Um, the video, um, there you go. The reason for um, the test is a lot of those pipelines don't have precise material property characteristics. So you see here the core gets, the, the inductors get loaded and then you have a profiling tool that collects the information. So you move along the material surface uh, after engaging the load and you make these grooves here that we also analyze with uh, fine element analysis. Um, so let's go back to what really is going on in the process. The core piece makes these three grooves that are parallel and we go over the seam well. So we talked at the very beginning of the class and everybody had that in the summary about making, taking flat plates and making a pipe by having this welded seam. So the characteristics of that welded seam has a big influence on the property and that's why our, it's a special ability of our test to essentially scan over that weld and learn as much as we can. So we go over, make the three black grooves and while we're doing that, we're profiling back and forth over the three grooves we're making and collecting the profile of the groove. So this is a relatively sharp tip, then an um, intermediate tip, and a, a blunt tip that doesn't deform the surface very much. So these three conditions essentially lead you to a different amount of deformation, so a different strain in the material. And that's a little bit how we get the accuracy. Now, the significance of going over the welded seam is these are three different processes used for making those pipes. So in the old days, they were not applying the heat as quickly. And what happens then is um, your fusion is wider. So your heat gets uh, spread over a longer distance when it actually melts. You see here that um, you have a melted area, so with the area here with the higher hardness. So this was melted and cooled quickly um, at a higher final hardness. Um, there was a period of 20, 30 years where the manufacturer changed the process to apply the heat more quickly. So what you see is what was fused that's approximately from here to here is about half the width. These are to the same scale. Um, so that means, um, you know, a different vintage of pipe or a different process being used. Now, one reason I didn't talk about this at the beginning of the class is outside that fusion zone, what you see is these big peaks in hardness on each side. So that's our heat affected zone. Uh, if your process uh, supplies a lot of heat quickly in a small area when you take it off it's going to cool more quickly as well so with a lot of the steel you have hardnesses that are fairly high here um, and um, that's where you have low toughness um, the same it's it's the same base principle that I think everybody understands when you raise your yield strain a lot of times you reduce the toughness. So this is saying if I do a regular pull test, I'm not going to see a reduction in strength, but if I uh, have a pre-crack in that area, it's going to grow that crack a lot more easily. So one usefulness of our technology is um, if there is just a little bit of a heat flame behind the welding process. So you have your welding electrode where the two pieces of steel meet, where the, two, the pipe gets rolled, the flat plate gets rolled into a pipe. You weld it just behind it, you heat it, so you soften that zone, you temper the steel. Then it looks like this and you don't have these zones that are prone to cracking. Um, 
So those are things people want to know. Now, the real truth about this is we found out how important that was from them uh, after we built it. After we started testing, you know, you go and, and, and say, okay, we can give us some pipe, what, and then they eventually tell you, oh, well, you know, if you can tell me the difference between this and this, I want your technology. It's like, okay, that's great, because that's actually not that difficult to do for us. Uh, what has been uh, a little bit more of a challenge is to always do the test consistently. I mean, this is uh, relatively a small penetration depth. We go to less than 1% of the wall thickness. We need a good surface preparation. So we come and with the stylus penetrate the surface under constant load. The equipment has a self-guiding system. We have different ways of doing this. And um, at the end, what you leave, you're left with is just looks, looks exactly like this. And it is at a finer scale than a roughness here. This is the actual welded seam of the pipe so that you, we don't generate anything more significant than what is already on the pipe in terms of uh, roughness and anomaly. So um, this is really sort of the engineering side of things. And I, b because we have these three styluses, we were able to reach accuracy three months ago and start making revenues uh, for beta testing. So our solution is not third party approved, we went to the trenches to try it out. And you can see the actual current unit still looks like this. It's, um, it is a form of a prototype, although because it has the accuracy, we just to call it our units. And um, we present it at conferences, get more feedback because, um, this is probably the most important part for that five, 10 minutes is the, Main reason why I'll, we have a lot of startups that don't work. So what we're doing right now in statistics has one chance in eight of success, more or less. So it's been one of my priority uh, personally to build something people want. And uh, what it meant, and I was very, it's very, very hard for an engineer, and you face that a lot even as students, is to show your results and show your technology before it's actually super great, uh, because that's how you learn. As much as you can show something, okay, all right, what, if the, what the, about this data? What about this data? So you run a few tests, and then you learn exactly what people want, and it's affecting how to build it. So the first example for that is, we thought we would want to characterize any welds for any conditions, any, any special fabrication. and um, Therefore, we're trying to make our device very small to fit on different structures. When we found out that these people in the pipeline world needed our solution and were willing to pay a premium for it, well, as the pipe's very big, so we don't need a small device. And therefore, what, all we need is accuracy and be able to ship it or carry it by plane and not have it fail all the time. So those is, I've, I've, I've changed our criteria. Um, you can probably see there's a lot of things involved in the technology, there's instrumentation, there's mechanical system, and then you have to deal with the integrity engineer for the pipeline companies. So we needed a team that was diversified for that, and we had to stay very focused to that goal and not overthink that eventually our technology is going to be used for a lot of other things. Uh, in quality control because it gives a lot more information. It actually gives the yield strength as opposed to a hardness number. And then it's able to characterize those welds, figure out because when, it, when I talk about welding, I talk about lack of fusion, but another problem is this reduced toughness from that cooling rate, the quenching. And I think it is intuitive to most of you. It's just that I didn't emphasize it in class. I sort of took it for granted. So overall, uh, it was a pleasure to um, do this module with you guys. I appreciate the feedback. There are a few things, uh, again, that, um, oh yeah, uh, sometime if you don't know for sure, it's good not to, to make it uh, affirmative. It doesn't happen very often in these summaries, but every once in a while, somebody will make a guess, and I think it's better if you say, I think that's what it is, then you make an affirmation if you're not sure. Um, so, I mean, overall, I hope you've learned some of the engineering that goes behind 
um, structural materials. We can't cover everything. Um, always available if you guys have a project and you feel like you may benefit from just talking a few minutes or a little more, uh, shoot me an email. Um, I'm happy to help. That's the benefit of being a student in this class is you can reach out um, anytime you'd like. Thank you very much.